Open your Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning. And uh, we'll get Brother Dalton singing tonight. That won't be a problem at all. We'll make him sing. We'll make him sing again. How's that? What, what were you going to sing there, Brother Dalton? Oh, Jesus is still the answer. That's a good song, isn't it? Yeah. Don't you want to hear, hear him sing We Believe tonight, though? Yeah. <laughs> That's terrible. It'd be work twice. Or we could just make Brother Brady Dalton sing it. And, uh, oh, man. Yeah, Brady's saying no. Uh, it's good. Well, I'm sure glad you're here this morning. Appreciate all the folks who... Are here online as well, all the folks who helped make the service possible. Thanks again for the ladies in the nursery and the men in the nursery who help wash those children. Boy, what a blessing that is in our life and the, the folks who work in children's church. I'm thankful to be in a church that serves. I want to say just a special thank you to all those who came as part of our youth conference yesterday. Many, many, I believe 70 to 75 plus workers from First Baptist Church, from you folks, came to serve yesterday at our youth conference. And yesterday, God brought us with those workers, 625 people here. And that was a blessing. God's word was preached. Brother Adrian Burden was with us. You may remember he came this past summer in the summer preaching conference. And yesterday did a tremendous job preaching. He'll be back this summer. But boy, what a great day yesterday. Many hearts were touched by the young people. Many folks mentioned to me they were thankful that we were able to have a youth conference in this time right now. And we were glad to do it. We're, we're glad to have that and have the ability to do that. The staff, uh, st staff here did a tremendous job. If you were here, you saw some of the skits they put on yesterday, and those were just great. Those were fabulous, including uh, throwing a young man into the Baptist tree. All right, just all, all part of the fun and games there at, for, at the youth conference. We baptized, and it was great. But uh, boy, we're glad you're here, and uh, thanks for all the help yesterday. Boy, God touched a number of young people. Thanks for that help in that First Baptist Church. It's a great church that I'm able to serve at, and I'm thankful to be here. And I'm excited to be here this morning as we look at our theme again, Only God I have a new series I'm starting this morning that will be the next few weeks, Sunday mornings. How long will the series be? Only the Lord knows, and he hasn't told me yet. But I'm excited about this series. I've entitled the series, Fabulous Lessons from the First Three Kings. You ever read your Bible and come across some of those amazing stories in the Old Testament? Amazing stories. Uh, yesterday, Brother Burton preached on one that I love, the story of David and Goliath. If, if, if you know that story, say Amen. Do you love that story? Tremendous story, fabulous story, fabulous lessons. But beyond that, those first three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon, have some, I believe, some tremendous truths, some tremendous lessons, some good, some bad, that will help us as Christians. You know the, that the Bible is practical for you and I today? I can read about those kings about, from God's word, God's inspired word, and they can affect me today. They can challenge me today. The Bible is not just a book I reference, right? It's a book I read to follow. It's not just a science book, but the Bible contains many scientific facts. The Bible talks about the world being a circle before scientists said that. The Bible talks about how important your blood is, the life of the flesh is in the blood, before science and the medical field caught up with that. In fact, they used to think it was okay to just drain people of the bad blood. Boy, did they figure out that wasn't right. And I'm glad they did, right? You and I can live a little bit longer because they don't just drain the bad blood out of you. Oh, boy, they realize that the life of the flesh, like the Bible says, is in the blood. Though the Bible has scientific facts, the Bible is not just a science book. Though the Bible has historical facts, the Bible is not just a history book. For many years, there was controversy because the Bible mentions a group of people called the Hittites. And the archaeologists could not find any record of the Hittites until one day they found remains of, guess who? The Hittites. Look at that. The Bible was right all along. Well, the Bible is not just a history book. Anything the Bible says about history is true. The Bible, some have said, is a manual for life. I think that's a pretty good description. God gave us his word. And the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And God wants us to look at his word. And as we go to the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 9 is where we'll find our text this morning. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, there may be times as you read through the Old Testament that you think, well, what does this mean to me? Why would God put this in the Bible? Maybe it's a nice story, but, but does it have any, any lessons for me? And I want to, with God's help, the next few weeks, look at some fabulous lessons from the first three kings. Now, I originally, when I began this planning for this series, I was going to say fabulous lessons from the kings. 
But I realized very quickly that if I did that, we'd finish up somewhere in 2029 or 2030. And that I probably shouldn't be that long inside of it. So we'll just take the first three kings for the next few weeks. The first king was, was King Saul. But I want you to look just at one verse right now. We'll end up looking at most of the chapter. But in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse number 16, God is speaking to Samuel the prophet. Samuel was a gift to, to his mother from the prophetic um, proclamation of a priest. Hannah was praying, praying for a child, praying so fervently that the priest thought she was intoxicated. He got after her, don't, don't drink anymore and come to the temple. She said, I'm not drunk, I'm paraphrasing the account. She said, I'm not drunk, I'm not intoxicated, but my heart is so heavy, my heart is so passionate, my heart weeps so much. Apparently the priest was more used to seeing drunk people than people passionate about God. I hope that at First Baptist Church, we more often see those who are passionate about God in prayer. I hope that if someone sees you praying, they don't think, oh, are they drunk? I hope their first thought is, wow, they must be with their heart bent toward God. The priest said, it'll be as the Lord said, he'll give you the child. And sure enough, Hannah had Samuel. Samuel was a good prophet. Samuel was a good judge. Early on in his life, God came to Samuel and he called him in an audible voice. Samuel thought it was a priest, Eli, where Samuel lived. He ran to Eli and Eli said, it's, it, I didn't, it wasn't me that called you. And he ran back to bed and again, God called his name, Samuel. And, and again, he ran back to Eli. Eli finally said, listen, Samuel, this is God. So next time says, here am I. And sure enough, God speaks to Samuel, and, and Samuel was raised up. He's been a good judge, but now there's a little bit of background because now the people aren't happy. The children of Israel aren't happy with what's going on. Samuel had a couple of sons who weren't that good. Samuel had a couple of sons who weren't spiritual in their mindset. In fact, the Bible says that when Samuel was old, in chapter 8, he made his sons judges over Israel. The firstborn name was Joel, and the secondborn was Abiah, and they were judges in Beersheba. And his son knocked, walked not in his ways, the Bible says. They didn't follow in the path of Samuel, but turned aside after lucre, that's a Bible word for money, and took bribes and perverted judgments. Can you imagine this great man, Samuel, used mightily by God? Obviously filled with the power of God through the Spirit of God on his particular life. And his sons are nothing like him. In fact, what the Bible is telling us that when people came for decisions, the one who had the most money got the best decision. I'm so thankful that our God does not work that way. That I have to pay my way for forgiveness, pay my way for a blessing, or pay my way for decisions. And Samuel's sons, they took, they followed after money. They wanted more money, and so they perverted, they changed, they um, distorted judgment. Instead of judging righteously and correctly and justly, they looked at the money and said, Boy, you've got 500 bucks, you've got 1,000 bucks. Stinks to be you. And apparently, everyone knew it. Because the people came to Samuel and they said, we want a king. Your sons aren't like you. Apparently, everyone knew of their poor testimony, their poor example, their deluded and perverted and distorted judgments. Samuel is grieved. Samuel is grieved. I don't know the disconnect between Samuel and his sons. If you study a little further back, you'll find there was a dis disconnect between Eli, the priest who trained Samuel, and his sons as well. Just as a little side note, I pray that my children will go on further for God, not go further away from God. I pray that my children will do greater things for God than I could ever even imagine. That's what I pray. They'll have to decide one day, just like Samuel's sons have to decide, and we all stand before Jesus Christ. Samuel's sons cannot say, oh, I, wasn't, I didn't know, Lord, it wasn't my fault. We all have excuses. 
We are all tempted to make excuses. I'm blessed because I see the Susanna Knowles this morning, a daughter to the, to the Flanders, a lady who has followed after her parents' footsteps in spirituality. All right, a lady who is following the Lord. I've known Mrs. Knowles for a long time, since college I've known Mrs. Knowles. Always a heart for God, as long as I've known her. What a blessing. What a blessing. Their son, pastor, about 25 minutes away from here, doing a tremendous job down there. Other daughter, I believe, serving in Florida, correct? Serving in Florida. I pray that my children will go on to, to serve God, but Samuel's sons didn't. And Samuel is grieved. Samuel is discouraged because the nation has asked for a king. And in chapter 8, God says to Samuel, don't be grieved. Understand that the people, the nation, in chapter 8, verse number 7, he said, they have not rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me as king. He said, they've not just rejected you as a judge and you as a prophet. They're rejecting ultimately me. And God says, the people don't want me to reign over them. Now, my friend, be careful. Be careful what you ask for because sometimes God will let you have it. They asked for an earthly king to replace their heavenly king. And God said, yes. It's a verse in Psalms. To be quite frank, scares me. It talks about the children of Israel, not about this particular story, but about when they're wandering in the wilderness. And the Bible says, and God granted their request, but sent leanness to their souls. You and I, left to our own devices, our own choices, we don't know what's good for us. We think we know what's good for us. We think we have a good plan. We think we know what will make us happy. We think, we believe, we know the solution that we want. And when we face a crisis, when we face a problem, it's okay to pray. It's okay to pray specifically and say, Lord, would you heal this person? Lord, would you solve this problem? Lord, would you change these circumstances? But understand, ultimately, I want like Jesus, not my will, but thine be done. You see, Jesus prayed that way. Father, if it possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, either way, not my will, but thine be done. I'm so glad that God did not answer Jesus' requests. Because Jesus died on the cross. I don't believe that Christ's request was disingenuous. I believe it was genuine. I don't believe, though, that he was asking, this is just my own personal belief and study of the Bible, that he was asking not to, to suffer. I believe it was the separation from the Father that Jesus didn't want to go through. But the Lord didn't grant that request. And sometimes we need to make sure that what we're asking is right and lined up with what God wants because we don't know what we really want. Children don't know what they really want, do they? They'll whine and cry about something shiny and, no, honey, that's a switchblade. Look at that thing that's squirming. No, honey, that's a scorpion. Oh, that tastes good. No, honey, that's your fourth sucker in the space of five minutes, and you're about to go to Sunday school. And the teachers will hate me forever. They don't always know. God has given us, hopefully as parents, the wisdom to help d d guide and direct their, their steps like God does as a loving father for us. And the children of Israel came to, to Samuel and God says, Samuel, don't be discouraged. They've not rejected you. They've rejected me. It was after those account that were introduced to a man named Saul. We find him introduced in 1 Samuel chapter 9. Verse 16, if you look there this morning, the Bible says, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry is come unto me. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have. Lord, I ask that you would help me as I... Lord, attempt to communicate some of these truths from your word. Lord, I pray that the truths would be clear from your word, that the power of the word would be convicting in our heart and our lives. 
Lord, I ask that our needs would be touched this morning by your spirit through your word. Lord, I'd ask that if there's someone, people here who don't know you as their savior, that today would be the day that they look to you for salvation. That they turn to you from their sin and depending upon themselves and by faith trust you for your death and burial and resurrection. Lord, I thank you for this time. I pray you'd meet with us and touch us and change us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Come to 1 Samuel chapter 9. We're introduced to this man named Saul. In verse number 1 of chapter 9, we see Saul's credentials. Look there, we'll kind of work through a little bit of the chapter, and I'll give you some lessons from this particular account. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish. The son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorath, the son of Apiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul. Now later on, when Samuel goes to Saul, Saul will tell him in verse chapter in, tw- in verse twenty one of chapter nine, when Saul comes or when Samuel comes to Saul, Saul was going to say, "Listen, I'm a nobody. I'm from the smallest tribe in Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. There were twelve tribes of Israel. Benjamin being the smallest. Benjamin was the youngest son. He was the brother of Joseph. Remember back to Joseph." And Benjamin, being the youngest, um, apparently at times didn't have a lot of pull, being the youngest. Now, I am one of seven children. I'm the oldest boy. I have an older sister or another mother, however you want to look at it. What's interesting to me is that even when we get together for family gatherings, that the pecking order of life still takes place. Now, I don't know this always happened in the Bible times, but it appears the same thing happens in Bible times. We'll be together, and my youngest brother, many of you know him, his name is Anthony. He, he's, he's, he's a man, he's not a boy. He has a, a good job, he makes good money, he's accomplished. He, he is on every level, you'd look at him and say, he's a successful man, not just a boy, not just a young man, he's a man. But when we're together as a family, and there's Jana, my older sister, myself, and then there's Aaron, and then there's Adam, and then there's Alicia, and then there's Joseph, and then there's finally Anthony. When we're together, and opinions must be given, I have been called a type A personality. I don't know if that's true or not. I will tell you that I have six other type A's in the family than my brothers and sisters. Perhaps I'm a type A as well. We are full of opinions at the Howell House. Right or wrong, full of opinions, and we're all relatively outspoken at the Howell House. Um, But when my brother Anthony speaks, the baby of the family, the youngest one, one who, I change his diapers. When he speaks an opinion, we still to this day look at him and almost as if we say, why are you talking? (laughs) You're the baby of the family. You, You get nothing in life. You don't have an opinion. You will do what we say. Now, you understand, those with families, I think, understand what I'm saying. Like, like Saul in verse number 21, where you, if you look there, please, where he says to, to Samuel, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then thou speakest so to me. Saul says his credentials, listen, I'm a nobody. I feel like I'm a nobody. I, I come from a family of nobodies, of a tribe of nobodies. Now, we serve as somebody, but I'm a nobody. Why are you coming to me? I look at Saul's credentials, and I, and I see something that we often undervalue where God has placed us. We often undervalue the place that God has put us. We don't see the purpose of our place in this life. And Saul says to Samuel, why are you coming to me? Go to somebody more important. And listen, my friend, God can use anybody. God wants to use everybody. God can use anybody. God wants to use everybody. If you're a Christian, God wants to use you. If you're not saved, you're not a Christian, God wants to save you, then he wants to use you. God can use anybody. God wants to use everybody. But we often undervalue where God has placed us. Well, I'm just in Saginaw. I'm just in Birch Run. I, I, I'm 80 years old. 
How can I be used by God? That's what Saul is saying. He is undervaluing where God, what God is doing there. In fact, Saul says this, boy, we're the least. We, we don't have very much, Saul. But we're, we're, we're nobodies. What's interesting is in the story, in, in chapter 9, in the beginning, or I think it's verse 3, where Saul goes to look for these lost cattle, we'll look at in a minute, he takes a servant. Saul says, I'm a nobody, but he's got some servants. I read an interesting story about that. It was at an at a exclusive, a private school in the Hollywood area. Apparently, this school was attended by uh, a children of, of famous movie actors and actresses. And one of the little girls in class was asked to write a composition. According to the account that I read, she wrote it this way. Once upon a time, there was a poor, poor little girl. Her father was poor. Her mother was poor. Her nanny was poor. Her butler was poor. Her chauffeur was poor. In fact, everybody in the house was very, very poor. Careful, my friend, don't undervalue what God and where God has placed you. That's the exact place that God wants you. And I, I let me get to where I'm going with this whole message this morning. But God wants to use you. Don't undervalue where you're at today. You say, listen, I'm in a small family. I'm in a small house. I've got nothing. Listen, you've got something when you've got Jesus. And maybe your bank account is not as full as you want it. Maybe your car is not as new as you wish it was. Maybe your house is not as big as you wish it was. Maybe your second house is not as big as your neighbor's second house. But listen, you've got Jesus. You've got something. And being in America, we've got something. But beyond that, every Christian has got something. You've got Jesus. You've got everything. Don't undervalue where you are, but beyond that, and I see not only his credentials, I see his characteristics. Verse number two. He had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man, and goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. Saul at first, at the end, says, listen, I'm a nobody. But as we look at, the, at Saul's characteristics, we find out that he was tall and handsome. Tall and handsome. The Bible says that he was a goodly person. That refers to his looks. In fact, another word, if you were to look that word up, another word you could use is beautiful. Saul was beautiful people. You looked at Saul and you said, wow. That's a good-looking guy. Wow. Not only that, he was tall, head and shoulders above everybody else. You couldn't help but notice Saul. I have to wonder, though, I've worked with young people for a long time. I wonder if along the way he was ever unhappy that he was so tall. You think Saul went through some gangly years that every young person seems to go through. I know of very few of any young people who don't go through the awkward stage, and those who are taller more so than others, it seems. The feet grow bigger than they were. They're two inches bigger than they were yesterday. You walk along, you trip a little bit, and, and you don't know where your hand's at, and you go to reach a glass, and boom, the water goes everywhere on the table. You have to wonder, maybe along the way, that, that Saul's like, boy, why am I so tall? Oh, sure, it has its benefits. Hey, Saul, I need that jar from the top shelf. Yes, Mom. Hey, Saul, I need to paint the living room. Okay, Mom, I don't need a ladder. Tell you, maybe you know Zach Evans. Zach is a tall, tall young man. I'm so grateful that he's here at church, a tremendous guy. I think working junior church this morning. I envy Zach Evans. We paint sometimes. Zach can cut in a room without a ladder. I have to use a little step stool. Saul didn't have to. Head and shoulder of everybody else. Saul's characteristics, he was a goodly person. You know why God blessed him that way? Not so that he could walk around, look how tall I am. Look how handsome I am. Look at me, I'll be a model for the face of Benjamin. No, that's not why God blessed him that way. God was preparing him for something later on. God gives you now what you'll need then. Right now, use what God's given you so that you're ready for then. 
Listen, my friend, and listen, young person, listen, adult, God has placed you. You say, wow, God's blessing me financially. You know what? God may ask for it right here. He prepares us for those tasks. You know what? It's a good thing. I believe that he was tall because then he had some, some leadership from the nation of Israel. He had some ability. They could look up to him. You know, they, they wanted their king. You could see how God's preparing him for that. And I see Saul's characteristics and already see the hand of God at work. You see, God has uniquely gifted for what he has uniquely called us to. You may feel like you have no talents, but God has gifted you. I see Saul's credentials. I see his characteristics. But then I see Saul's circumstances. Verse number three, the Bible says, And the asses, the cattle of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise, go seek the asses. Verse number three, the Bible tells us what's happening. One day, Kish, Saul's father, walks out there, and the cattle's gone. They're not where they're supposed to be. So now Saul has to go find them. Now Saul is in a set of circumstances that were not his fault. He's in a set of circumstances that he didn't choose to be in, and now he has to go pick up the pieces from these circumstances. But these circumstances were the exact circumstances that God was using to connect Saul with Samuel. These circumstances, from the cattle to being a king, from these circumstances, God is going to have Saul anointed to be king that if Saul had not traveled to find the camel or the, the cattle he would not have come across Samuel the prophet you see the circumstances that God's God takes you through shows God's hand is at work in our lives. Sometimes we don't understand the circumstances. Why are my cattle gone? Why do after I go find them? Because God is doing something bigger than we can see and that we can possibly imagine. Do you think for one moment that Saul got up and said, boy, there ought to be a king in Israel and I hope it's me. I don't think that in any way, shape, or form, shown by his response. I'm the least, I'm a nobody, I'm unimportant. There's no way that Saul got up and said, wow, there's a king, and I happen to be taller than everybody else. I think it should be me. I'm the tall guy. I don't think so. I don't think that when Saul began to look for the cattle, that he said, wow, you know what? I bet there's something really important going on here. I bet if I look for these cattle, it's going to all come together in my life. I bet this is the moment I have been waiting for when I find the cattle. I don't think that for one minute. Saul's in some circumstances, the providence of God, the hand of God. My friend, don't miss, don't miss the hand of God in your life. Don't miss the hand of God in your life. God's hand is all around us working those things, not with just a temporal mindset, but with eternal and eternity in view. He wants to use you and use me. Through this chapter, he's looking. He can't find them. They took some bread. They took some provisions, the Bible tells us, and they found nothing. And finally, finally, the servant says, you know what? Come and let us return. Or Saul says, let us return and go home and take thought for us. We're about to go hungry. That's verse, uh, verse number five. And the servant says, behold, in the city, there's a man of God. Let's go ask him. Saul says, listen, how can we ask him? We, we don't have any bread left. All we have is a little bit of money. The servant says, let's go ask him. I love the fact the servant turned Saul towards someone else. Just in a side note, listen, the Bible says in the multitude of counsels, there's safety. Saul and his servant go to, go to Samuel. Samuel says, listen, uh, come back for a feast. They go to a feast, and you find that in verse number 22. And when Samuel takes Saul and the servant to the feast, they put Saul and the servant in the VIP seats. Saul and his servant, this least among the people, in the smallest tribe, least in his family, is now sitting at a table of about 30 people, and he's in the primo spot, and his servant with him. From looking for, smel from, for smelly cattle, all the way to the hot seat, the good seat. After the feast is done, Samuel says to Saul, listen, come with me, I'll tell you what the word of the Lord is. He takes Saul away, and he anoints Saul. 
He says, let me tell you a couple things. We find that in chapter number 10, beginning chapter number 10. He says, your cattle are okay. <laughs> Don't worry about the cattle. Apparently, Saul was still worried about the cattle. And Samuel says, listen, stop it. Your cattle are fine. All right? It's not about the cattle. It's not about that. It's about something else. The cattle are fine. But number two, God has a calling for you. You're going to be king. Anoint him with oil. Then he says, Saul, it's going to be confirmed a few ways. You're going to come across some people. You're going to prophesy. You're going to come across your uncle. He's going to tell you the cattle are found. Get ready because God, Saul, has a big plan for you. I was studying for this message. came across this account. The Lord gave me, I believe, three lessons from this account. Just give us very briefly three lessons this morning. God often uses those who seem to have little offer. My mind was turned to the widow at Zarephath who fed the prophet. She had little offer, but God had big plans for her. My mind was turned to the small boy who God said, I want your five loaves and two fishes. My mind was turned to the hornets that God used to defeat an army for the children of Israel. My mind was turned to a young girl named Esther who was called upon to save a nation. My mind was turned to some fishermen and a tax collector who God said, I want to use you and you can turn the world upside down. It's not what you have, but who has you and who you have, and that's Jesus Christ. God often uses those who seem to have just a little to offer. Someone said it this way, no one thinks of the pen while reading a letter. They only want to know the mind of the person who wrote the letter. We ought to be the pen in God's hand. My friend, God can use you this morning. God wants to use you. And, and you may not know how God wants to use you, but just trust him. Just look for the hand of God. Number two, you may feel life is at a loss, but God's never lost. I'm looking at that cattle part, and I, I look at Saul beginning and ending. He's looking for cattle. He's missing the picture here. Don't miss the picture. You may think it's about going to work, but that's not about going to work. It's about that lost soul at work. You may think it's about an accident by the side of the road, but it's not about the accident. It's not about the lost car. It's about the person at the accident you can give the gospel to. You may think that life is at a loss, but God is never lost. You may think it's just an illness and God has you at the hospital, but it may not be about the illness. It may be about the nurse at the hospital who needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. You may feel like life is at a loss, that the cattle are lost, but God's not lost. He's doing something. Look for the hand of God. Don't miss the hand of God. Don't get so consumed with this that you miss this. Last of this morning... God has bigger plans for you than you do. We often have some plans. I've been called a dreamer, optimistic. I'm okay with that. Some have felt it their job in life to chop down my dreams. I'm also okay with that. If you're a pessimist, a.k.a. realist, you don't discourage me. Like those two boys... One was a pessimist, one was an optimist. The father said, well, I'm going to cure this optimist. This son doesn't see life the right way, I'm going to cure him. And so for the son's birthday, he'd been asking for a pony, but he got him a room full of horse manure. He said, this will surely cure my son of his optimism. Went out there about half an hour later, and the son had a shovel, and just shoveling through the manure with a smile on his face and whistling Dad was just beside himself. What's, what's wrong with my boy? He said, son, how can you be excited? I got you a whole room of horse manure. And the boy replied, yeah, dad, but with all this horse manure, there must be a pony in there somewhere. <laughs> you know what? God has bigger plans for you than you or I do. We may have plans, we may have dreams. Boy, this would be neat. It's okay to, to seek after those things and, and to pray for those things. But God has bigger plans. All right, he has eternal plans. Now, at times, it may look like small plans. Oh, God, I'm only doing this. But God is doing something even bigger because he can take our efforts. He can take our actions, our faith in him. And he will make those things of eternal value. It may be elevated to kingship from cattle to king. Or maybe a servant to the king, 
But with God in control, the plans are huge. Someone said, I look back and I see my mistakes and failures. My past and thwarted dreams, but God looks back and sees the cross. God looks back and he doesn't see how I failed 50 years ago or 50 weeks ago or 50 days ago or 50 hours ago or even 50 minutes ago. It's not on his radar what God looks back and he sees not me, but he sees his son Jesus Christ. It's not a 50-50 with the help of God. It's not 99 or 100. It's 100% of God working in and through you and me. Hudson Taylor, tremendous missionary for Jesus Christ. Hudson Taylor said this, all men... All men who have done something for God have been weak men. All women who have done something for God have been weak women. And this morning, God wants to use everybody. And God can use anybody. My friend, you may not understand what life is like right now. It may feel like the cattle are lost. It may feel you're running around for the cattle... But my friend, don't miss the hand of God. It may be today. It may be tomorrow. But let God turn your upside down world right side up. Christian, let God take those things that you think are meaningless, that you think are unimportant. Or my friend, a life that is too broken or too unnoticeable or too untalented. Let God take that life and let him do something great for it. You see, that is a fabulous lesson from the life of Saul. He took a nobody and he made a somebody. And be not weary in well-doing, for in due season, when God's time is right, not your time and not my time, but his time. And his time's not my time. Sometimes I think God's watch is broken. Can I get an amen? Amen. Sometimes I'd like to buy him a watch. I'm just being honest. For in due season, not my time, not your time, but in his time, we shall reap. If we faint not. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, I know you want to use us. Lord, you want to use everybody, and you can use anybody. Lord, we must follow you. Lord, help us to learn this lesson that what you've given to us is important. We may not see it. We may not value it. But Lord, it's important. When you're here this morning, my friend, you say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Maybe you're here and you've been a little bit discouraged this morning. Maybe you feel like life is lost right now. The cattle are lost. Your life is upside down a little bit. Maybe you're here this morning and boy, you're have missed the hand of God in your life. You've been distracted by what's down here, missing that God's doing something way up here. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel too unimportant for God, too untalented, too small for God. I wonder who would say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Lord touched my heart this morning. Would you pray for me that I'd respond to God the right way? I'd love to pray for you this morning, my friend. Would you just slip your hand slip back down. I'll see it. Amen, amen. Hands all over. Who else? As you spoke, God spoke to me. Something in my life that God spoke to me. Who else? Amen, amen. Who else? I see that hand. Who else? Amen, amen, amen. I wonder if you're here this morning, my friend, and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've never looked to Him for salvation from your sins. I wonder if you would be willing to let me pray for you as well. I wonder if you're here and say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? Now, my friend, I'll draw no more attention to you than I did to anyone else. But I'd love to pray for you this morning. We'd love to open a Bible and show you from God's Word how you can know for sure that God loves you and Jesus died for you. And by trusting in him and him alone, he'll save you from your sins. What if that's you this morning? Pastor, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Would you pray for me this morning when you pray for the others? 
My friend, if that's you, would you slip your hand up, slip it back down, I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it, and I'll pray for you this morning. Lord, you've seen the hands. Lord, you know the hearts. I pray that those who acknowledge, Lord, that you touched them this morning, that they'd respond to you, whether they need to encourage them, whether they need to continue on. Lord, may they just follow after you and respond to you. Lord, I pray there's someone here who's never trusted you as their Savior. That this morning you'd prick their heart and allow us to show them from the Bible how they can know for sure. Lord, bless this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.